am a man that has spent a lot of time playing the Dead Rising series, especially the original Dead Rising released in 2006, which I got all of the achievements for. Three times. So it's safe to say I was excited with the announcement of this Dead Rising Deluxe Remaster. I obviously spent a lot of time researching things that had stayed the same and things that had changed between the original game and this remaster, and eventually discovered there had been a change in some of the achievements. And there's an estimated completion time of 75 to 100 hours. What you just said is one of the most insanely idiotic things I have ever heard. Despite having no idea of the achievement changes at this time, I was confident I could unlock them in significantly less time than 75 hours. So today, we will not only A, try to get every achievement in the Dead Rising Deluxe Remaster, but also 2, try to do this in less than 75 hours, which we'll use the Xbox stats page to confirm how long this actually takes. No. But enough about me, well, let's talk about Frank West, photojournalist, war coverer, ladies man. I can feel your eyes on me. <coughs> yep, yeah you can. Frank finds himself travelling to Willamette, Colorado to research a news story on riots that have been happening in the town, but when flying over he discovers the National Guard blocking the roads, as well as the riots he is here to investigate. Uh, a, a change, for sure. Oh wow, I've got, I've got an achievement! Photojournalist! Is that just take a photo? Take first photograph, there we go, we've got our first achievement already. Once off the helicopter, we're introduced to the only man that has made me question my sexuality, 2024 Carlito Keys. Like, come on, look at this guy. If he wasn't an international terrorist, this man would be a Hollister model. Oh, I didn't know he was a terrorist. Where's the spoiler alert? The game's 18 years old. Grow up. Besides not answering any questions and just being overall sketchy, Carlito provides us with no information at all, and we head into the security room where we pick up the next achievement. The movement felt weird then, just to say, oh, we got an achievement. Welcome to hell. Is it the Willamette Parkview Mall? Once we actually make it into the mall, we enter the entrance plaza, where we discover this is not a riot, but instead a zombie outbreak. What? Did you just say zombies? You're goddamn right I did! We use this opportunity to get some easy PP and take some pictures of a large group of zombies at the door for the group photo achievement, and also the survivors in the area for the portraiture achievement. Which is where I hear the most heated conversation between two NPCs I have ever heard. I work for a living. Work? <laughs> Is that what you call that hanky-panky with that big-titted secretary now? Oh, please. I can't wait to see the look I'm on your scared. face when those zombies eat you. I'm it would be scared. hilarious. That's my line, Buster. Is, are we done? The messy divorce aside, we have more pressing matters to worry about, as this old lady starts reliving her youth by beating off two old men. She opens the main doors to the entrance plaza and lets all of the zombies into the mall. Being the lover of life that I am. Verlene, no! What's happened to Verlene? Oh, poor Verlene. Being the lover of my own life that I am, we avoid the zombies and head back up to the security room where we're introduced to Brad, Otis, and Jesse. And skipping all introduction, Jesse decides to steal our camera and look through all of the photos we've taken. Once we've had our stolen goods returned to us, we make our way out to the rooftop and collect Jeff and Natalie Meyer the first of many survivors that we'll need to save whilst playing the game. With Jeff and Natalie returned to the safe house, we continue towards the Paradise Plaza, where we get attacked by Jesse, which is where the most infamous line of the series occurs. Kinda. I'm but, as we've all heard it before, I don't think we need to see it again, and we'll just head to the Paradise Plaza and meet Kent. Kent is a photographer, just like Frank, who wants to test Frank's ability behind the camera, so we follow him around for the next five minutes, taking photos of him taking photos, and doing his signature cool pose. Hey man, that's not cool. With Kent out of the way, he challenged us to take an outtake photo, worth 500 pp before we see him again, which is very different than the picture of Jesse's jugs he wanted us to grab in the original game. So we put 10 novelty masks on zombies for our photo, which also unlocked the costume party achievement. We then jump off a cliff. <sighs> oh. oh. I, I really did try to roll. <laughs> but we got an achievement, free fall. Brad is still being shot at, which is a cause for concern, but future-proofing this playthrough is more important to me. So instead, we head to the maintenance tunnels, where not only do we pick up the maintenance tunnel key, we also pick up the next achievement. Nice. Boom, baby, strike! With our time wasting out of the way, we make our way to the food court, where we discover Brad is being shot at by Carlito. But we all like a bad boy, don't we? Yeah, not a f 
Terrorists like Chris. Despite my initial hesitations, we have to kill the sexy Central American, which fortunately isn't too much of a challenge. Besides Otis calling me several times during the battle. Yes, thank you, Otis. With Carlito down, we strike a deal with Brad where I can investigate the zombies as long as I help him with his search for Dr. Barnaby, starting with heading to the entrance plaza. But on the way there, we beat the crap out of Bert, recruit him and Aaron, and also collect Leah. Oh, somebody please think of the children! We then get to the entrance plaza where Brad speaks with Dr. Barnaby, who refuses to come with us back to the safe house. We'll see how that works out for him later on. On the way back to the safe house, we pick up Bill, shoot down some zombies for the bullet point achievement, and get into the battle against the convicts. You know, the convicts that have come from somewhere, despite there being no evidence of a prison nearby, who have managed to steal and hotwire a vehicle, which of course just happens to have a heavy machine gun mounted on the back, with an insane surplus of ammo. Those convicts, yeah, th th those ones. Whilst these convicts have a machine gun with the attack power of a nuclear bomb, they're no match for a middle-aged man wearing a Lego helmet and holding a submachine gun. So, not long after, we managed to take them down and steal the vehicle. Which... survivors just refuse to get in. Like, I get not getting in the back. There is currently a dead man sat there. You, you don't want to touch that. But, get in the passenger seat. They fell out the passenger seat! Anyway, we got the carjacker achievement, recruit Sophie, and take all of our survivors back to the safe house. Once back at the safe house, we let Brad and Jesse know of our plans to leave the town on a helicopter in the next three days and agree that they can use this to get Dr. Barnaby out as well. Why we didn't let Brad know this two hours ago, when we were stood next to and having a conversation with Zed Doctor, I don't know. But... Not my circus, not my monkeys. We have a bit of time now before case two starts, but that doesn't mean there's nothing to do. Just as we left the security room, we got a call for one of, if not the, toughest psychopath in the game. Adam. The, the clown. And with how tough he can be, we need to prepare, which unfortunately meant taking on another psychopath. Cletus. Cletus is an alcoholic gun enthusiast, and looks exactly like I would imagine an alcoholic gun enthusiast would look. He also looks like he lives in a shed in the middle of the woods, but you know, that's, that's not really relevant. Whilst Cletus doesn't seem massively unreasonable at first, not wanting to share his weapons, there's not really much coming back after you've blown someone's intestines out of their torso. Oh, so, for the best interest of the other survivors, like my lovely Barbara, we should probably kill him. As we've just seen, Cletus is not one to shy away from shooting you with a shotgun, and that's something we need to be careful of in this battle, so my main plan for this is maintaining my distance. Fortunately, this is helped by the fact that Cletus' shotgun shoots you about 10 feet backwards. Sorry, that, that's about the length of 1.8 Chevrolet Silverados for my American viewers. Fortunately, once we make it out of the gun store, we can use the door as cover and can continue to blast Cletus with bullets until he eventually falls. Self-defense! Let's go! We killed the psychopath! With Cletus out of the way, we loot everything we can out of the gun store and make our way to Adam. Adam the psychotic clown has too many chainsaws that he will use to brutally murder you. Funnily enough, this is also the number of mutilated children he has tied to the roller coaster he seems to be religiously protecting. Adam can also use the double chainsaws to break your weapons and block literally every single bullet from various weapons, and because of this, our tactic for this battle revolved a lot around running away like a little pussy. This was until I discovered the plan of waiting for him to attack, successfully dodge this attack, and then slice him in half with a katana. Don't get me wrong, a lot of this plan still involved running away, but this was now done under the ruse of dodging. Eventually, using this tactic and rinsing through a lot of ammo, we managed to take Adam down. Adam out of the way, we save Greg, collect Shinji and you. Who are you? You. No, not me, you. Yes, I am you. Which got us the, the artiste achievement, which is unfortunately grammatically correct, and then follow Greg to the Wonderland Plaza toilet to unlock the mall worker achievement. We then go to the North Plaza and collect David, before bringing them all back to the safe house, which brings our survivor total to 11. We fortunately now have a bit of time with no survivors on the map and no active psychopaths either, so we use this time to head into the underground tunnels and just run over zombies, netting us the road rage and zombie hunter achievements. And on the way back to the safe house for the start of case two, we head into the universe of optics and get our fifth piece of clothing, getting us the sharp dresser achievement. Case two takes us back to Dr. Barnaby, who, since refusing our help, is now hogtied over a group of men. And whilst that might be some people's fantasies, I don't think Dr. Barnaby, at the age of 62, is part of that generation. In other bad news, I'm being shot at with a 50 caliber sniper rifle. That is bad news. 
Carlito is once again attempting to murder people, which, as a reporter, is somehow my problem. Like, I know I made a deal with Brad, but I really don't feel Frank should be getting involved with armed warfare. That being said, I shoot Carlito with a gun until he dies. Woo! Let's go! Unfortunately, Brad got injured in the battle against Carlito, so we now need to get him some medicine, taking us to Sean's food and stuff, where we're introduced to Steven. Not Sean, who's a completely different person and has no affiliation with Sean's food and stuff. Steven, who is running around with a woman's unconscious body, because nothing screams psychopath more than human trafficking, must have the only shopping cart in the supermarket without a broken wheel, because the speed this man has is supernatural. And on top of that, he can turn on a dime and just runs you the f*** over. We manage to get a good amount of damage off using the shelving units for height, before he absolutely destroys us with a shotgun. But we get back into position and take him down, once again with the SMG. And we also managed to get the photo of Steven for the Psycho Photo Achievement. More importantly, we introduce ourselves to this woman who doesn't appear to be too friendly. Whether it's the fact I'm dressed as someone who just broke out of prison, or the fact I'm dressed as someone who has a severe mental illness in this mask, I'm not sure, but she just runs off. We grab the medicine from the supply room, go and get Tonya and Ross from the Wonderland Plaza, and make our way back to the safe house to give the medication to Brad. Thanks a lot for bringing back the medicine. Oh, is that it? Uh, is that all I get? <laughs> that completes case two, and we have about two in-game hours before the next case, so we very quickly head to the Alfresca Plaza and collect Gordon, who proceeds to do everything in his power to die. Where is Gordon? Gordon is dying over there. Get off. Gordon, come on. What was the point in giving this man a chainsaw? He's been... I, I had some white juice and it made my leg... Right, so Gordon drank cum, and now he can't feel his legs. Fantastic. When we get Gordon back to the safe house, case three starts. And that's it. Case three consists of doing absolutely nothing. My job here is done. But you didn't do anything. Whilst there's no story for a good four and a half hours game time, there's still plenty of stuff we need to do. First of all, we head down into the Paradise Plaza where we rescue Pamela and Heather from a horde of zombies. Totally didn't forget they were spawning there. <laughs> we then head over to Ronald, who is complaining about being starving and won't let us save him until we feed him. Starving. Ew. We give Ronald a cream pie and he agrees to join us, at which point my bestie Kent spawns and we show him the picture we took earlier of all the mass zombies in place of Jesse's knockers. In absolute disgust over the lack of orbs Kent sees, he challenges us to one final photography challenge tomorrow at noon and then just disappears. From there we head to the North Plaza and into Chris Lip's home saloon where we're introduced to Cliff. Cliff is a Vietnam War veteran, or at least he was, that is now suffering from PTSD after his daughter got eaten by zombies. Cliff knows his way around this room better than his daughter knows her way around a zombie's digestive system, so with his trusty machete he's easily able to chop us down. What he isn't prepared for is the fact that I'm from England and if there's one thing we know about, it's knife crime. With my in-depth expertise on how to defend myself from and use knives, we give Cliff a taste of his own medicine and cut him down to size. With Cliff now reunited with his daughter, Inhale. we can go to save his survivors, Rich, Josh, and Barbara. We're coming to get you, Barbara! On our way back to the safe house with our now six survivors, we enter the Paradise Plaza and encounter the Raincoat Cult. Don't you dare tell me that Sean I'm 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 going to quit. <laughs> what do you mean? Just like Pennywise, we murder the people in yellow coats and save Jennifer before returning to the safe house with all seven survivors. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is how we cut 25 minutes of gameplay down to 1 minute and 36 seconds and earn zero achievements doing so. Thank God that's over. We make our way to the Wonderland Plaza where we're introduced to Joe, who has somehow not killed any of her survivors yet. Joe is a morbidly obese police officer and now abuses her power to sexually assault four innocent women, who she deems to be, and I quote, I can only imagine this is due to Joe's bad upbringing coming from a rough childhood. Probably something to do with Joe Marmer. <laughs> you know what? That's fair. Equipped with a handgun, a taser, and a police baton, Joe has various different ways of defiling you. But as you can imagine of someone that has the build of WWE's Viscera, she's not the fastest person around, and we use this to our advantage, shooting her in the face while she walks towards me and slicing her with a katana after we dodge her attacks. With Joe out of the way, we take a photo of Kay for the census taker achievement, and then escort Kay, Janet, Lily and Kelly back to the safe house, just in time for case 4. 
where Frank is now tasked with locating the mysterious lady that has run away from us first in the entrance plaza and then once again at Sean's food and stuff. You're starting to look a bit desperate here, Frank, especially considering this mission is literally called Girl Hunting. Whilst this woman is somewhat important to the story of this game, we have the small priority of having to save Nick and Sally before they fall into a group of zombies and are eaten alive. So we head to the Wonderland Plaza first, kill some cultists for the no thank you achievement, and then recruit Sally and Nick before we head to the North Plaza to meet whoever this is. Whoa, 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 mysterious girl, move your body close to me. Come on, move your body. It turns out our mysterious girl isn't much of a chatter, as instead she just decides to run us over with her motorcycle. Whilst I wouldn't normally expect this battle to cause too much trouble, we had the slight problem of Otis calling me three separate times for things happening in the entrance plaza. Oh my god, Otis, f off! And if you didn't know, it's incredibly hard to cut someone in half with a chainsaw when you're on the phone. Once we do manage to hack and slash our victim down, as the respectful adult I am, I can essentially pin this woman to the floor and we agree to meet again later on. She also finally gives me her name, so I fortunately never have to use that god-awful mysterious girl meme again. Come on, move your body. That concludes case 4 and we have a bit of time before case 5 starts, so we make our way to the entrance plaza to murder an entire family which provide no difficulty at all. We then recruit Jolie, Wayne, Rachel and Floyd before returning them to the safe house and giving this fat prick some food so he doesn't eat my survivors. Ronald McDonald's mutiny averted. <laughs> Ronald McDonald's mutiny averted. We had to meet Isabella in the North Plaza, but when we meet her, we discover that she's been shot by her brother, Carlito. <laughs> Being the gentleman I am, and I'm sure with exactly zero ulterior motives, we agree to carry the smoking hot Central American lady on our back to the safe house. Oh yeah, and we saved Kindle as well, but no one really cares about Kindle. With Isabella back at the safe house, that brings an end to case five. God, it really feels like Capcom gave up on the cases at Case 3. Like, what, what have they been, five minutes each since Case 2? We have a small amount of time before the next case, so we use this to head to Colby's Movie Land, where we're introduced to Sean of Stephen's Cult and Stuff. Unfortunately, it appears we have interrupted a satanic ritual of some sort, and as you can imagine, Sean is less than pleased, but can you blame him? Imagine you were just in the middle of something and some obnoxious asshole. Hey everyone, if you're enjoying the video, be sure to like and subscribe to the channel. Don't forget to turn on notifications so you can get notified of my future uploads. Thanks. But yeah, that, that's it. Obnoxious asshole done. Sean takes out his anger by plunging a sword through my extremely hairy chest. But it turns out when I do that, he just dies. So overall, a relatively easy battle. We collect Nathan, Michelle, Ray, Beth and Cheryl and return him to the safe house before making a mad dash to the food court to pick up Gil and a bottle of wine for Floyd. Whilst we're in the food court, we get our 30th call from Otis, which unlocks the transmission area achievement, which was significantly harder in the original game. We get Gil back to the safe house and commence case 6, where we murder a pensioner. That's it. That, that's the case done. We make our way to the North Plaza to pick up the hidden survivors, where I totally remembered to take that photo of the duct to the safe house. Ha ha ha. Ha ha ha. We then make our way back to the North Plaza again to pick up Alyssa, Brett and Jonathan. At which point Paul, the long haired punk spawns, but what he should be called is the lanky ass b as he just runs away from you, throwing molotovs behind him in hopes that they damage you. What Paul isn't prepared for however, is being blasted with a 12 gauge shotgun. But in Paul's defence I'm not quite sure how one would prepare for that. Paul defeated, we unlock the Punisher achievement for taking down 10 psychopaths and then spray our white stuff all over his nuts before recruiting him, Debbie and Mindy to our ever-growing army of survivors. We then wait for the sick man scoop to start which also spawns the hidden survivor Susan. And once we've recruited both of them, we unlock the tour guide achievement and take all 8 survivors back to the safe house. At this point case 7 starts which consists of Carlito <laughs> threatening to just blow up the entire mall. And I I'm not quite sure what's worse. Turning the whole town into zombies or making and planting bombs in an attempt to blow up the mall and everyone in it. It's safe to say blowing up the mall and adding another case of terrorism to his rap sheet isn't great and we should probably put an end to that. But I'd much rather kill a psychotic photographer. Kent, absolutely enraged that his photography skills are no match for a middle-aged journalist, decides his big break is going to be murdering someone. No, I'm not sure about that one. I don't know if that checks out. Whilst Kent doesn't have a specific weapon to kill you with, he hits you like a freight train and can take down almost all of your health in one hit. Fortunately, our kicks are just as powerful and using those with a katana, we absolutely destroy him. 
We save Tad and come back for Simone before heading to the safe house, where Kendall is organizing a mutiny, which we very quickly put an end to. I think not! And with every survivor saved and both mutinies averted, we have successfully saved every survivor in the game. Now let's get back to stopping Carlito from blowing them the hell up. With that act of terrorism diffused, a nice little bomb joke for you there, we get a cutscene where we see Brad being attacked by Carlito and pushed into the maintenance tunnels surrounded by zombies. We head back into the maintenance tunnels and find Brad. Are you hurt? What do you mean, are you hurt? I can literally see his intestines. There, <laughs> My man is dying. <laughs> Brad literally just asks us to kill him, and with that, we unlock the Snuff Shop B achievement. We then head to the Alfresca Plaza, where we pick up our last clothing item for the Clothes Source achievement. Just for the record, this pair of glasses was labelled completely incorrectly, and I went to the wrong shop seven times. And we also knock over 10 zombies with a parasol for the Raining Zombies achievement. And then we head over to the Wonderland Plaza to grab our last PP photo, unlocking the PP Collector achievement. <coughs> oh yeah, we, we also got a PP photo earlier, my bad. On top of that, on the way back to the security room for case eight, we get the Marathon Runner achievement for literally just walking. That brings us to case eight, where Jesse and Isabella are trying to think of what Carlito is going to do next, when Isabella suddenly remembers Carlito has a laptop, which will probably have loads of terrorist plans on it. My goodness, what an idea. Why didn't I think of that? Hammocks. We escort Isabella back to Carlito's safe house, which is literally a loft. This, this is the equivalent of living in your parents' basement. But on the way there, we grab the zombie road achievement for walking on top of zombies. Once we got to Carlito's hideout, we get a call from Jesse to say that she's seen something on the monitors and we need to go back to the safe house. Fantastic. This was a huge waste of my time. On the plus side, we do manage to get the nice, nice shot. shot achievement for launching a golf ball off of the roof. Jesse lets us know that she has seen Carlito getting tugged off by a butcher in the maintenance tunnels. So we make our way to the meat processing unit where we're introduced to Larry. Like any good butcher, Larry is a man who takes pride in the meat that he provides and how fresh his produce can be. It's just a shame that for this freshness, he needs to sacrifice the exact person that has the password to a laptop we need access to. In the interest of Frank's big scoop and letting the world know what truly happened here at Willamette, we must now save the sexy terrorist. Larry has both close and long range attacks, from chopping you in half with a massive cleaver or throwing a massive carcass at you. But much like any other boss in the game, he's no match for being shot in the face. With our trusty SMG, we managed to whittle him down before giving him a forced circumcision with a chainsaw. Larry's death completes the notebook, unlocking the full set achievement, and we steal jewelry from Carlito's dead body. I love stealing. I love taking things. We make our way back to Isabella and let her know that her brother is dead. He's dead. We also give her back her family heirloom, which prompts her memory for the password and gets her into the laptop. And that is it. She does nothing more with that information. Our only objective now is to make our way back to the heliport and await our escape helicopter. But when we get to the safe house, we find that Jesse has turned into a zombie and finding her gets the Snuffshot J achievement. Whilst we have the full ability to skip time here and just complete the main story, there are a number of achievements that require us to murder a lot of military personnel, which is a lot easier said than done. No, 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 no. I'm not dying to goddamn military. Oh my God, I'm actually dying to the military. Holy I've died. <laughs> what the f***? They don't die! They've taken seven shots with a shotgun! Okay, truth be told, I didn't think the military were going to be this difficult. I can't believe these guys actually know how to use their guns. Over the next 40 minutes, which is an excruciatingly long amount of time for what we needed to do, we have the task of killing hundreds of soldiers. We start off by shooting down a military helicopter with a total of 12 shots, which doesn't quite seem right, but after getting absolutely rinsed twice, I'm not going to complain. Taking out the helicopter gets us the helicopter achievement, and from there we proceed to kill 10 Special Forces soldiers for the Legendary Soldier achievement, followed by 30 more Special Forces soldiers with our bare hands for the Karate Champ achievement. And then finally, we pick up an RPG from the military and blow up zombies for the Rampage achievement. Or should I say we pick up three separate RPGs because they do as much explosive damage as a party popper and kills a maximum of 10 zombies per shot. Those achievements out of the way, we make our way to the helipad and complete the main story, which gets us the level max achievement, humanist achievement, three day survivor achievement, and the overtime mode achievement, bringing the total to 39 out of 50. This takes us into overtime mode, where we discover Frank has become infected with fucking death and Isabella needs a list of nonsensical items in order to make a cure for us like a modern day Mary Curie. Like realistically, what the hell are we going to do with a magnifying glass? What, what's this going to be used for? 
On the plus side, we do a sick-ass jump and blow up some people with a rocket launcher. Once we return to Isabella with her items, we complete some other tasks for her and eventually make the decision to leave them all through a tunnel we found underneath the clock tower in Leisure Park. On our escape from Willamette, Isabella and I managed to hijack this military vehicle with a turret on the back. And it, it was a good thing that that was so conveniently placed there because now we need to fight a tank because, you know, <laughs> why not? Fortunately, our first and only section of the game not playing as Frank goes relatively well as the tank does literally nothing to us, bringing us to the final battle in the game, Brock, the leader of the military takeover. It turns out Brock was also the leader of the military operation in Santa Cabeza, Isabella and Carlito's hometown, and we've all seen how successful that was, so it's safe to say I wasn't too worried about his skills going into this battle. A casual backflip kick followed by a disembowelment completed by an overweight 40-year-old man later, Brock goes down, completing overtime mode and unlocking the Saint achievement and the infinite mode achievement, putting us on a nice total of 43 out of 50 achievements. The seven remaining achievements unfortunately have to be split into three different sections and essentially three different playthroughs. First of all, we load up a new playthrough with our existing Frank, unlocking the Never Give Up achievement. We then make our way around the map, picking up various different food products, and then make every mixed drink for the Juice Freak achievement. And then finally, I blow the head off of 14 survivors. Whilst that isn't exactly an achievement, being the massive feminist I am, I need to have eight female survivors in my party, so that means all men need to cease to exist. Once we have the eight females in our party, we unlock the Grateful Eight achievement. The second section is for the Zombie Killer and Zombie Annihilator achievements, which requires us to drive around the maintenance tunnels for two and a half hours. That's it. It's literally the most brain-numbing thing you could ever do, and I suppose that's why they locked the most powerful weapon in the game behind it. I decided not to stream this, first of all because this would not be entertaining, and second of all because I spent the whole time listening to copyrighted music. In a nice change to the original game, the remake carries over any kills from previous playthroughs so we already had some of the 53,000 required kills. What that meant, however, is that I had no idea when the achievement was going to unlock. Didn't care, and I guess I like that. Didn't step up, I sort of step back without me, without... Well, guess that makes it into the video. Having no real reason to show you any more of that, we also unlock the Zombie Annihilator achievement, which brings our total up to 48, and leaves us with two remaining achievements. Perhaps the two toughest achievements in the Dead Rising series, Five and Seven Day Survivor. Exclusive to the Dead Rising Infinite mode, these achievements require you to survive for five and seven days. It's, it's really not that confusing. Whilst this might not seem like the most difficult thing to do at first, each day in Dead Rising is equivalent to two real life hours. So these achievements take a minimum of 14 hours to unlock, not including any breaks for your real life survival, such as food and drink. And unfortunately, you can't just leave your game running while you go about your day as your health is constantly depleting, meaning you have to make your way around the mall, brutally murdering both survivors and psychopaths to make sure you have enough food to survive. But on the plus side, at least we don't have to fight the military in this game mode, right? Found it. Found it. Oh my god, it's the military! Okay, so the, the military are there, but at least they fixed the food court, which breaks on day three, right? Whoa, 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 shots, shots, shots. Shots. What the f is going on? Okay, so there's military and the food court still breaks, but there's no raincoat cult that I have to worry about, right? Oh my God, I didn't even see them. They are following me. Oh my God. Frank, move your fat ass. Holy Christ, leave me alone, leave me alone, leave me alone. Yeah, so they made some interesting changes to infinite mode. Fortunately, not all of these changes are bad. First of all, the psychopaths and survivors' spawns don't seem to be on a schedule anymore, like they were in the original game, so you can technically have an infinite amount of food, and on top of that, you can actually look at your map to see where these have spawned, so you don't need to decipher what the hell this is. Like, I love the Dead Rising wiki, but dear god, this is a, a mess. And another improvement they have made is the introduction of time skip. This absolute godsend of a feature allows you to skip time greatly reducing the potential 14 hour playthrough. To start our playthrough, we make our way around the mall and collect each of the survival books, which will increase the amount of health we get from healing items by 200%. We then make our way around the North Plaza and collect any food items we can find, so we have something to heal with if we get into trouble. From here, we make our way around the map, brutally murdering some innocent survivors and some not so innocent psychopaths, and with a backlog of food, we then sit in a bathroom. And that's about it. That process on rinse and repeat. 
Sure, we had some interesting moments, like when I was incredibly close oh, oh, to death and got saved by a footstool, stopping the military from chasing drink, and murdering drink, drink. me. Or when I walked out of a door and had a firing oh. squad about to blow my skull off. No shot. But overall, the adjustments made to the game mode made it relatively easy, especially in comparison to the original game. And after two hours and 40 minutes, we've unlocked both the five and seven day survivor achievements. But the most important question is, how long did it take to unlock all 50 achievements? Did we manage to do this in under the 75 hour mark? And the answer to that is yes. I have no idea who wrote that article or what they were smoking when they did, but they were most definitely wrong. We managed to unlock all achievements in an impressive 15 hours and 36 minutes. With that, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, be sure to like and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one. I've covered wars, you know. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs>